Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time. This is show 30. And um, the premise of the show, if this is your first time, I'm here with Zena Shevchik. My name is Joe Nash. We're both librarians here at the Colony Library. What we do is we go down to the new bookshelf, and we go down to our technical services department where they're processing all the new books that come in. And we brought up a whole bunch of new books and new items to tell you about. And I just want to say one quick thing for people if you've never seen it. We do the library, we get about 100 new books a week on the adult side. This is just a small sampling. And for example, I have here a biography, a book on art, a sports book, a book on ethics, a book on education, a book on haiku poetry. We probably won't even get to all these to talk about. But we all have all kinds of books. Plus, we get tons of fiction every week. And this is a small sampling. And Zena will go first. And Zena usually, I'm sure, will have books of not regular size. She's good at bringing <laughs> up the bigger books. But anyway, that's the show, and here's our first book. Ah, oh, yes. Um, my first book is called Walking the Amazon, 860 Days, One Step at a Time by Ed Stafford. This was actually uh, published uh, at the end of August. This is uh, November 26, I think, and uh, 2012, and this was, so this was published a few months ago, and I meant to highlight it at one of the uh, previous shows we did, but didn't get to it. Uh, I read this. I really liked it. It's not something that I would normally read. It's short, uh, relatively speaking. It's a paperback, um, and it was, it's just an amazing tale. Um, he, he is British, the man who walked the entire Amazon from uh, its source to its end, from coast to coast, uh, and he tells quite a tale. Uh, he is 31 when he starts the uh, trek. It's uh, 2008. It takes them almost two years uh, to do it. They had planned on doing it in a year. Uh, it's just amazing what they had to deal with. Um, the grit, the, the grit, the determination to keep going is just amazing. He does have um, a background uh, in physical things, um, feats. He excelled in rugby, 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 <laughs> rugby um, as, as a British uh, teenager, and uh, he went into the British Army. And before he decided to do this trek, he was uh, a leader of expeditions. They call them conservation, kind of ecological expeditions in, in Belize. And so he knew quite a bit about the jungle, but he details the whole preparation it took and the, the paperwork they had to get through, the funding they had to get through. And he, um, to get the funding, he had to promise to write a book and do a blog and um, be on the uh, web uh, while he was uh, doing the walk, wherever he could uh, actually get connections. But it's truly amazing. He, the partner he started with dropped out after three months, and he, his guide, um, someone who agreed to go with him, uh, who was a local guide uh, to travel with him just for a few days, stayed uh, for a year and a half with him. So Wait, he said he would only go for a few days, he, and he stayed. The, the <laughs> guy, yes, yes, okay. and um, and I mean, just uh, the, there's pictures in the middle of the book that uh, just amazing, and it was a fascinating tale. kept me um, okay. kept me entranced. So highly recommend. Right. I think I read so. some good reviews of that. What did he do? He just followed the river? He followed the river, but he, they talk about how it floods. Yeah. Uh, it's a relatively, um, it's not a deep river, and it floods and goes okay. over its banks, and, it, uh, and it's unpredictable, and how they met natives who weren't friendly, uh, besides all the animals and bugs and diseases. Did he get, and, did he get sick? Uh, not very much. He, right. He's a real, he's really incredible a lot of the uh, books specimen, are... physical specimen, I'd say. 4,345 okay. miles. So. Did you ever read, that sounds, did you ever read that book, The Lost City of Z? 
No. Oh, that's no. another Amazon adventure. That was really good a couple no. of years ago. No, no. All right, one of the best things about reading biographies, besides finding out about, finding out about the person and who they are and whatever, if it's someone you're really a fan of or someone you really like, it makes biographies more, I mean, it makes them better, I think. So this is one of my favorite authors, a biography of him. And it's called Thornton Wilder, A Life, a new biography of Thornton Wilder, the playwright and the novelist. He sort of has an interesting place in American letters. I'm on, I'm on page 100. It's really good. Um, it's a long one. It's like 800, 700 pages. Did he, was he in the early 20s? He, he was 20s? born in 1897. Okay, that's right. Died in 1975 right. or six. But he has an interesting place in American letters because he was, he was primarily known as a dramatist. He, he won two Pulitzer Town. Prize. He has Our Town, Skin of Our Teeth, Matchmaker. Sort of odd, sort of not eccentric kind of plays in a, in a certain sense. I mean, Eugene O'Neill and, and um, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams had a lot of the same themes. His plays are, are kind of different. He didn't write as many, of course. But, and he also won, he won two Pulitzer Prizes for, in drama. He also won a Pulitzer Prize in fiction, The Bridge of Stan Lewis Ray. And his novels, oh, I haven't read all, that? yes, I haven't read all of them, but one of his novels called Theopolis North is one of my all-time favorite novels. But anyway, this new biography take, is, um, is his whole life. It's the first biography of him in like 20 or 30 years. It's the first biography to rely on a lot of his family letters and diaries, which were never released before. I guess there's thousands. Very interesting family. The father really controlled everything. There's millions, thousands of letters back and forth. And he, so far, he's, I'm at the part where he's in college, and it's very interesting. He was always wanted to be a playwright. He, he wrote plays when he was a kid. They lived in China for a while. His father was in uh, council. And so far, even though he's only in college, it's very interesting. I haven't even got to the part where he becomes a famous writer. But again, sort of an eccentric kind of writer. He's different, I think, than a lot of American. Like I say, he's, his writing is, you don't follow the usual themes and patterns, I don't know. But one of my favorite authors, Thornton Wilder, and here's the new biography, Thornton Wilder, A Life by Penelope Niven. So okay. like I say, when you read biographies of people, if it's someone you really like, it makes it a lot more That's interesting. That's a thick book. There's a lot of notes at the end. <laughs> the book has, I'll tell you in a second, if I, if I exclude the notes and the bibliography, the epilogue ends on page 703. But I read the first hundred like that. It was it's really good. Must be an interesting person. Yeah, he, he was an interesting. The warrant 700 pages. He was an interesting guy. Okay, good. Mine's much more pedestrian. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, called Hidden America from Coal Miners to Cowboys, an extraordinary exploration of the unseen people who make this country work by Jean Marie Laskus. So it's a woman who uh, spent time with uh, some people we wouldn't normally, normally come into contact with. She spent time with uh, coal miners, blueberry pickers in Maine, uh, roughnecks workers on an oil dri drilling rig in, on Alaska's um, slope. Did I'm she work with them? Called. She was actually spent quite a bit of time with them. And she got to know, I don't think she worked with them, no. But she must have done, gotten involved to a certain extent. Cattle Ranch in Texas, a landfill in California. I didn't read that part, but that sounds interesting. I did read the fee, uh, a woman, long haul trucker. And that, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, she really gets into their personal lives and how they maintain some kind of a, a personal no, life no. within the within the context of it's that. sort of like nickel and dimed. Yes. Book. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, it's more. I don't think she's exposing so yeah, much okay. as as just bringing to light. But it's like uh, yeah. right these jobs and what it entails. I mean, you can kind of imagine what working on a, an oil rig in Alaska. Uh, might entail. Yeah, it's for, probably very hard. <laughs> it, it's not. Well, they, she says the people who are there want to be there. Yeah. And I think that that uh, traditionally is what I remember reading about people who live in Alaska, is that generally people who are in Alaska want to be there. They're getting mm -hmm. away from what's going on in the the bottom 48 or whatever is that's what it's they the call last, them. It's the, the last stop. The lower 48. <laughs> I said the bottom 48 <laughs> or 49. <laughs> um, so I found this very interesting. I particularly like the female long haul trucker, and um, and uh, I read that one and the oil rig, 
And that's, I think that's, his, but they are, oh, she also does air traffic control at LaGuardia. So I, it's, uh, she's, I, there are some interesting things. She talked about the blueberry picking in Maine and how there's actually no white people now who do that. Yeah. It used to be a family affair, and people used to do yeah. that as kind of an activity, and uh, that they actually pay pretty well, and still they can't get uh, white people, lo local people, to do the work. And uh, she says they, they treat them very well uh, as far as migrant uh, workers go. And so that's an interesting uh, hidden but necessary work okay. and how it supports our way, our American way of life. By the, okay. these people doing their It sounds a little here. bit like. Um, Judge Turkel. No, John thinking. McPhee has a book called Uncommon Carriers, where he spent time with people in different transportation, like a like a tugboat driver, or a long haul trucker. Oh, he spent some time in the UPS, the hub in Denver. Oh, so Ten million. What's that called? Uncommon, Uncommon Carriers. Carrier? Excellent book. All about, and he worked with them, and he talked to them. It was a very interesting book. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think this is fascinating because most of us will yeah. never meet yeah. a blueberry picker from Maine, even though we're all eating Or a coal blueberries. miner. Or a coal <laughs> miner, for sure. Now, I don't think many of us will be on an oil rig in uh, Alaska. Well, so. my next book, I was just talking about biographies. Now, now this, this book is another author. I've read many of his, I've read a few of his books and I've read a lot of his articles, but this is his sort of autobiography. A very famous um, ethicist. He was one of the founders of the field of bioethics. I guess that's a combination of ethics and biology. <laughs> he writes a lot about medical things. Right. And his name is Daniel Callahan, you may know of him. It's called In Search of the Good, A Life in Bioethics. He started the Hastings Center right down in Hastings on Hudson. Um, they put on a newsletter, they, they tackle ethical issues in the medical field. So he, he's always, a lot of his books lately, in the last 20, 30 years, are all about what's going on in the medical field. Not just the cost, but the ethical issues. And he was, he, he sort of came up in the, I think the what, 40s and 50s. He was the editor of Commonweal in the 60s, which was a Catholic publication, a liberal publication. He has since sort of fallen away from the church, they say. <laughs> he says. That's the term they falling use. Falling away? But the really interesting thing is, because I read an excerpt from this book and I read the introduction, he, he, was, he says that for his, um, what he does for a living, being an ethicist, it, just being an ethicist and a bioethicist, he thinks that being raised on religion and studying religion and all that, even though he's fallen away from it, it, made, it has made him a better ethicist and he thinks more ethics people, more ethicists should study religion or at least be familiar with it because he thinks that one of the reasons he left philosophy in Harvard was he said it was all studying this symbolic logic, it was all, it was all linguistics, it was all, it was all nothing, they never went after a sort of a higher meaning or anything and that really, that's why he left, he bothered him. Then he, so anyway, and then he started by, he started the field of, he started studying medical ethics but then I guess, I don't know if he coined the term bioethics but um, he ended up being one of the founders of it, him and Willard Galen. So anyway, and like I say, I read an excerpt in a magazine. It was really good. I read the introduction was good. I skimmed the, I skimmed the chapter on the 60s because so many, there were so many changes in the 60s and the cultural upheavals and, and everything, and plus in medical stuff. And like I say, lately he's been writing about health medicine and the cost of medicine and end of life issues and all that. Yeah, was, uh, so anyway, and he's a wonderful writer and I guess he's sort of he's sort of famous. I have you heard of Daniel Callahan? He might nope. have okay, some of his books. Anyway, this is his it's not a straight autobiography. It's kind of got more like it's more like a theme because he's in his 80s now and he said he he'd rather write on different themes through his life cuz he he says a lot of a lot of events are melding into. He doesn't have the exact order down. Anymore. <laughs> but it's a wonder. What I've read so far is wonderful. So it's Daniel Callahan in search of the good, a life in bioethics. It's, yeah. it's, what I've read so far is really. It's the kind of book. It's only 200 pages. Right. I There's think. enough meat in here to talk about for 10 volumes of stuff. It's really really good. What I've read so far. But I'm going to read it well, next. Yeah, I think bioethics is larger than medical ethics. Yeah. It's just probably like cloning and that. He could, yeah, cloning. Articles. He was on the um, President Bush's um, commission on stem cells when that was all going on. He's a very interesting guy. What was his, did you didn't get to the. No, point but he brings, a, he brings a perspective, I think, that he says because 
of his um, religious life, I guess, earlier than what before he left, he, f he finds that his point of view is sort of missing from the, I don't know, regular ethics. I don't know what the term is. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or he finds a lot of ethicists don't have that, mm -hmm. that, that, that um, aspect, I guess, to their work. But, right. So anyway. Sounds good. OK. That's good. You're bringing things to our attention <laughs> that we don't know about. I'm the big questions guy. That's right. You are. And I'm the, I'm the here. This is something everybody knows about Facebook. Although I don't know that much about it, which is why I like this book, Facebook for Seniors. My theme today is going to be big. Joe says I bring big books. My I meant my, odd size books. Oh yeah, well my theme. I know what you meant. I'm being <laughs> silly. Um, my I'm uh, like this book because uh, as I'm aging, I'm appreciating large print, and uh, this book is large print, and it has great big pictures, screenshots of uh, things that you know you'll see on the computer and it gives superb directions step by step by step directions on how to use Facebook how to uh, keep yourself safe and uh, since um, a lot of us elderly or older people are being dragged kicking and screaming uh, into uh, Facebook onto Facebook and maybe Twitter um, I just want to bring to um, our older uh, audience that there is actually a book on Facebook, step by step by step, very delineated and very clear on how to use Facebook, how to sign up, how to keep yourself safe, um, and all, all, how to keep your computer safe. It goes into all the different kinds of security for computers, and um, I think it's really, really um, excellent book and I like these books where there's lots of pictures uh, for using computers and you don't have to strain your eyes uh, well maybe you have to strain your eyes looking at your computer but at least you don't have to strain your eyes looking at the book so uh, to our collection <laughs> development librarian Joe large print is great this is full color large print well they actually call it larger print <laughs> rather than large print I'm not sure what that uh, the difference is, but I uh, think it's a fantastic. Well, as long as you're the, that book addresses, you're addressing um, the computers and seniors. Does that book address the most common question we get at the library from seniors and computers? Which is? How do you get to the Google? How do you get to the Google? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it just okay. says you have to have a computer and you have to be on the internet. And All right. It. So my next book, shall I continue with the big questions or shall I go go, ahead. go with them something? Well, this isn't exactly a big <laughs> question. So go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll continue. Um, this book I've read uniformly, excellent reviews, and it looks very interesting. I was skimming it. Um, it's by David R. Montgomery, and it's called. The Rocks Don't Lie, subtitle, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood. Ooh. Now, he, he has started out, from what, I, from what I gather, and I was skimming, it's very well written, and it's not overly scientific. He's a, he's a geologist, he's written all kinds of stuff, but um, he started out, what he wanted to do, he said, was write a refutation of the creationists, they think, um, the earth being what's 5,000 years old or 6,000. And then he said, as he got more into it, he started reading more texts and different mythologies and religious books that re refer to the floods. And he found out this flood myth is common across a lot of cultures and religions. So he started really sort of more getting into it. And of course, he's a geologist, so he was going into the, the rock, the, ge the geology aspect. And he found out, he, he found out that there's, um, investigating Noah's flood was one of the, um, what's the, I'm trying to think of the right word. A lot of geologists, in, like in the 1700s, studying the flood, that's, that almost started in some ways some aspects of the whole, the whole field of geology. So he, was, he sort of said, well, wait a minute, there might be more to this than, now he, he, at the end, I think he does say the earth is obviously billions of years old, but he, the book ends up being, from what I've read, and I was skimming it, he ends up saying that science and religion can coexist, and he talks about in this book how science and religion investigate a lot of the same things, only in different ways. So it turns out that um, the reviews I read said was good, and that 
and he, he even says, it's, um, he has nothing against religion. He's, it's not an anti-religious book. It's, I guess it's a pro-science book, but it's gotten some um, interesting comments and, re and, like I say, reviews. And so I, would, I don't know. It looks, it looks very interesting. But he, he just ends up, ends up saying that religion and science can coexist, and they, they, should, they should try to coexist instead of being... Find common ground. Find common ground. We, not be antagonistic toward each other. And um, so the rocks don't lie. A geologist investigates Noah's flood. Not so. be set in stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead with the puns. That's good. No, I, it, different it, perspective. I um, I read a lot, but yeah, it looked it looks very. I was skim, skimming. It looks really interesting. Well, my next book is a, uh, about a big question. Uh, I suppose you could call it a big philosophical question, but it's a little book. Um, you can buy happiness and it's cheap. How one woman radically simplified her life and how you can too. Now we do have quite a collection of simplified living uh, books in our uh, collection. Uh, this is the latest one and I, because it's short and sweet um, and written uh, in a very um, entertaining way, I recommend this. Um, at the end of every um, chapter. She gives a few suggestions for moderating your intake of stuff and getting rid of stuff. So it's the philosophical idea of, <laughs> of accumulating stuff for what purpose. And she talks about how your stuff, the things you own, end up controlling you. And so she, she uh, outlines her and her husband's uh, efforts to what she calls smart sizing rather than downsizing. Um, they were loaded with $30,000 uh, dollars in debt, mostly from student loans, and she worked in investment uh, mm. uh, banking in a major city. And she says she her her aha moment was being stuck in a massive traffic jam, coming back from her um, uh, banking job or investment finance job, and realizing that you know she, if she's so smart, why with money, why is she spending so much time in a tra in traffic? So she, she talks about how to do it, how he, she and her husband uh, started to do it, how it is such an emotional thing uh, to get rid of stuff uh, and to kind of buck the trend. I have to say myself that that's the most difficult part is that if everybody around you is accumulating stuff, your friends, your family, and it's very hard to be the naysayer. Um, but she also talks about um, how uh, emotionally uh, anticipating loss, even if it's just loss of stuff, is really wrenching for a lot of people. So she talks a little bit. It's not really touchy feely too much in here. It talks a little, you know, it has a little bit of a psychological edge to it. But mostly it's about how to take small steps just to simplify and uh, smart size, downsize your life. And she, she and her husband actually live, this is extreme, and she says it's extreme. They actually live in a little house on wheels that's parked in the <laughs> yard of a friend's house in, um, uh, in Portland, Oregon. But what's interesting is just the, the, the journey to simplified living and, and just confronting the fact that their stuff that own, own them. You know, they felt they needed a bigger house and then they needed a bigger house to hold the stuff that they had and yet they didn't use the stuff. There's a, at this, right at this time, uh, I'm seeing a new poster. Well, I, I, it's new to me anyway. That's uh, uh, black, in, uh, black with white writing that says in very large letters, you want, you buy, you forget. So, uh, you know, you want it, you buy it, you forget it. And, and uh, um, the new mantra of simplified living is why do you want this stuff that you're going to forget about as soon as you buy it? So I'm a proponent of simplified living, and I'm, I'm edging in that direction. So, okay, so you can buy happiness, and it's cheap. All right. Now, you keep mentioning the word stuff there. All I could think of was the old George Carlin. Stuff. The old George Carlin routine, <laughs> yeah, a place for your stuff. Remember that? I, <laughs> yeah, I do. That's, that's the only reason alone to, get, to have less stuff. You don't have to bring it everywhere and keep bringing it. <laughs> then you right. go, yeah, the whole thing. All right. Now, Zena. Joe. We all know that John Updike wrote something like 40-something novels mm -hmm. and short stories. 
and seven or eight books of literary criticism, each one about seven or eight hundred pages. Did you also know that he was, wrote a lot of books on art criticism? No, I didn't. He was the true, John up like the true Renaissance man, I guess you could say. I don't know how he had time to write everything he wrote. I mean, his five books of literary criticism and book reviews mainly is enough for a career for someone. For, forget writing everything else. He also wrote 40 odd novels. But he also has three books. This is the latest book of his art, um, art criticism. John Updike, it's called Always Looking, a picture of him in a museum. The covers of the three art books are wearing, it's a picture of him in the museum always you know, contemplating some work of art. The other books were called Just Looking and Still Looking, and here's the new one, Always Looking. Of course, John Updike died in 2009, but this is the last collection. He was a very astute art critic, and what he does, there's, there's a lot of excerpts from the shows he went to, there's a lot of pictures, a lot of the um, art shows he went to, and, and John Updike, in case you did not know this, his first, um, he wanted to be, a, before, he was a, before he was a writer, he wanted to be an artist. When he was a kid, he wanted to be a cartoonist. And I think he actually studied art in Harvard. But of course, he ended up being one of our foremost uh, American authors. So what he does is, he just, uh, most of these were printed in the New York Review of Books. And he would go to a show, a lot of them, are, there's a couple in here from Williamstown. And we go to New York, and um, there's excerpts from the show he went to, and he would really. Um, are they paintings that we would be familiar with? Oh, yeah. Well, with? for example, here's one. It's called, um, this was a show in February to April of 2006 from um, Treasures from Olana, you know, the house down in um, the south of here. I can't remember where it is now. Fre um, Frederick Edwin Church's place. And it was a, there's a lot of art in there, and, was, that's an, and it's, just, it's just the text. Here's one from Williamstown, the Clark Brothers. So the, let's see what he's in here on. What is American art? He went to a show on Gilbert Stuart, Frederick, Frederick Edwin Church. He went to um, an, an impressionist, impressionist show in early moderns, a show on Monet, Degas, Edouard Villiard. Gustav Clement, I, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, Joan Miro, he went to a surrealist thing, Roy Lichtenstein, you know, the guy with the comic book things. And he's a very astute writer of, um, of art criticism, besides all his other criticism. So John Updike, a multifaceted writer, and he wrote about art just as well as he wrote about literature. So if you like art and a different well, point of view. that really helps. Reading books like that really helps to me. And when you're, you yourself, it teaches you how, to, how you might yeah. want to look at art. So yeah, I, I, it, that really does help. And I think, you know, John Updike, again, he's not an art critic in the sense that's that was his living. He's probably, you know, like anyone else, he would go and here's the Monet show and just tells you what he thinks about him, shows the pictures. and It's what he sees, so yeah. what different people see when they look at art. And I, I, find that, um, I find that helpful because very often when I walk into an art gallery or something, I do not know how, what to look at. I yeah. don't really know how to look at it. And uh, reading books like that is very, yeah, I think very part informative. Of it, part of it isn't just um, looking at it. It's, it there, I guess you got to know sort of how to look at it. So right. he, I think he goes into that a little bit. Yeah. But wide range of tastes, wide range of shows he went to. Um, I don't know this Vulliard. Here's another picture, but you can't see. But anyway, John Updike's last um, collection of art criticism, Always Looking. Oh, okay. Looks very good. Uh, back on my large uh, print theme, uh, here's a beautiful book, Reader's Digest Book of North American Birds, an illustrated guide to more than 600 species. Now we have a superb collection of uh, books on uh, birds, um, and uh, but I particularly like this one again because they have, again it's paperback, it's easy to hold. Um, oh gee, sorry, I had a beautiful, I really liked uh, this the, the duck, the ducks, the pictures of the ducks. Um, they have a page for each of 450 species of uh, birds that spend at least part of the year in America or Canada. And uh, the pictures are beautiful, they're large, the print is large. Um, they show um, uh, what the range of the bird is in a map. 
they uh, tell uh, something cute or interesting about each each uh, species, and then they give the nesting and um, the food, what they eat, and a brief description of each. Um, what's interesting to me was that they uh, it shows mostly male, the male. Uh, part the male of the species because they say they're the ones with the uh, most color and uh, that's obviously uh, to me I think it's obvious that the female is protected by being less obvious out in the wild um, this book is divided by uh, kinds of birds birds of prey large land birds so they have a section called smaller woodland birds and smaller open country birds so that you can turn to the section that might be uh, the more uh, the backyard birds um, I loved uh, uh, looking at all the pictures of all the ducks and swans it's amazing uh, they also have a traveler's guide in the back about where the best 350 spots in the uh, US are to do some um, birding and um, in New York the closest one that they list is north of Scroon Lake it call, it's in North Hudson although there are quite a few birding places in western New York um, I just think this is a beautiful book and um, uh, because it's so large and easy to read, uh, I highly recommend it. Look at this beautiful bird okay, on the yeah, front. So okay, so we do have a good collection of bird yes, books. Yes, we do. And a lot of them are small. Yeah. And again, you have to peer at, you know, I that's and the print is small. This is beautiful. So. All right, so I think we have time for a few more. We're getting near the end here. This must be the day for favorite authors for me. Yes. Here's a new book. <laughs> I think it was, I was being put together before he died. He died earlier this year. And that is Ray Bradbury, who was loved by many people, including many, many writers. And this book is a new collection. It's called Shadow Show. I don't know if you can see that there. All new stories in celebration of Ray Bradbury, where famous authors, I think, write stories. They each wrote a short story, sort of an homage to the master. <laughs> and at the end, they all talk about what, why they wrote this particular story, what their sort of little history, why, why they loved Ray Bradbury, et cetera. Ray Bradbury was a much beloved author, as I said. But some of the authors in here that have written stories, you'll recognize many of them. Neil Gaiman, Margaret Atwood, Sam Weller, Dave Morrell, um, Lee Martin, let's see, David Eggers, Harlan Ellison, Audrey, Audrey Niffenegger, no. Niffenegger, I don't like him I'm saying that right. Joe Hill, Dan Cheon. So all, all pretty famous authors. Alice Hoffman's in here. Jacqueline Michard. So they all wrote a story in honor of Ray Bradbury. And I think as the book was being put together, the book came out in October, but Ray Bradbury died, I think, in the, what, in the late spring, early summer this year. So if you love Ray Bradbury and want to read some famous authors writing little homage to him. And, and again, at the end of each story, there's a little page or two by each of them explaining the, this particular story they wrote for this collection and their love of Ray Bradbury. So it's called Shadow Show. Did you like Ray Bradbury? Zena? A little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a great, I'm not a, I've read the basics of mm -hmm. science fiction. I haven't read a lot of it. Okay. So. Well, he was a much beloved I know he author. Well, I know his name, sure. And I know a lot of the good writers are passing away. Is that our, our generation? This is how I prefer to le learn my history. Joe loves uh, literature and history, and I love history too, but I prefer to my history with a, a little bit of sugar or something, uh, like uh, historical novels and historical dramas. Um, this uh, is The Chronicles of Downton Abbey. We just got, um, and it does, it's, I like it because, if, again, the pictures are, are big, um, and you get your history uh, not in too small type. Um, this is, uh, t this two-page spread is about the cigarettes, uh, the invention of cigarette-making machinery at the end of the 19th century ushered in an age of cheap cigarettes. And then it shows some of the ads and some of the containers that the cigarettes were, uh, uh, packaged in in the early uh, uh, 20th century and that's when Downton Abbey the PBS series Downton Abbey uh, uh, takes place 
in England, and uh, it has big pictures of the women's uh, clothing, so there's shots of the gorgeous, uh, authentic clothing that they wear in the show. The next series, there's been two series, two uh, series of the Downton Abbey, and now the third one's going to be in January uh, of 2013. And so this book kind of uh, precedes the um, showing of the third series in the U.S. It's already been shown in uh, England. Uh, and so there are some giveaways in this book about what happens in series three. But um, the pictures and the history that's presented of that time and what was going on in the world at that time, it, not just fashion, but as I said, like they presented the cigarettes, they showed the kind so of... Um, season three hasn't been on yet? No, okay. it's, it, it's been shown in England, okay. but it's not been shown in the U.S. Uh, but this book does cover some of series three. So if people don't want to... Um, uh, before be told what some of the action okay. is in series three, they don't want to watch it. But again, the, it's lo it's beautiful. I mean, it's just gorgeous. And again, you can take a real close look at the authentic um, settings and uh, even so the authentic uh, kitchenware, the kitchenware, kitchen tools. Um, there's a page from a cookbook that was used at that time. So it's it's just much more than just a um, a book okay. uh, about the series. It's okay. got a lot of history in it. Well, I will, I will end with this. The last several shows I've been mentioning how we've been buying. Um, I w I've been buying. You've we, been buying. <laughs> we, the library, have been buying um, audios, um, audio books of plays, mainly by the LA Theater Works, which is in um, all famous actors. I guess when they're in between doing stuff, they, they do these um, they do the they do these readings in front of an audience. I don't think they actually act them out, but it's a full length plays. You know, you've probably seen a reading. They stand there with the um, podium and they read. You know, they read the play. I think there may be a little acting out, but it's mainly. Um, and I've been listening to them as we've been getting them. I just listened to um, the Price by Arthur Miller with Richard Dreyfuss. It was fantastic. So these are the latest ones. They're sort of two classic plays of two. American classics and one new play. I was just on Broadway this year, but anyway. So here's that's some of the latest. Oh, I don't. I, it was already checked out. I was going to bring up uh, Major Barbara, George Bernard Shaw. But anyway, here's Twelve Angry Men, all-time classic American play. Some of the people in here: Hector Elanzo, um, Elizondo, Joe Spano, Jeffrey Donovan, Dan Castellana. Um, these are sort of James Gleason. Um, all actors that, you know, they're, they're pretty famous in their, when they're not doing these things, but LA Theater Works, you go to the website, they got great stuff. And um, like I said, I've been listening to all the ones we've got so far, they're great. Twelve Angry Men. Here's William Inge, Bus Stop, classic play. Oh, some conte young contemporary actors. Well, no, he, has, he wrote in the 50s. No, but I'm looking at oh, the, the actors. Oh, the actors, oh. Anson Mount, Rachel Miner, yeah, he's, um, let's see, who else is in here? I don't recognize people. But LA Theater Works, um, like I say, they produce these audio plays, and they're done. They're done in front of a live audience, so it's not like an audio book. You, you, you get the audience um, reaction, so they're they're good in that way too. And finally, this was on Broadway earlier this year. It's a play about um, an upper, let's see, upper class black family in, in their summer home, and the goings on, and the you know the family. It's a family drama. It's called Stick Fly. By Lydia Diamond, it got some pretty good reviews. Um, and let's see, yeah, and just about you know, it's a family drama. I think one of the kids they come home with somebody has a white girlfriend or something like that, and one guy like there's like an angry son or something like conflict I think it's a conflict, family. but it's an upper class black family, and it's um, like I say, it got, it got good reviews when it when it came out earlier this year. So you're just the latest, and we, we're we're going to be getting more. So. Yeah, I've had them on. We did, we reviewed. You reviewed. I talked about some. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So if you like audio books, and yeah, if you want something, something a little good. shorter than a whole book, and if you like um, classic American plays, I've already listened to. Um, what did I listen to? I've already listened to. Oh, I said the price, death of a salesman, with um, Stacy Keach. It was really good. And I listened to. Um, oh, Glass Menagerie, Streetcar Named Desire. They're excellent. So. Is that it for this show? That's it for the show. All right, that is all this time. We will see you next time.